Hello everyone, my name is Kitanjali Sharma and I am a graduate of Cambridge University having specialized in international economic laws and dispute settlement. I am here before you to present the module on the formation of the GATT or the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. To begin with, I would first provide a brief structure of the module. In the course of this module, we shall be covering three key elements. First, Bretton Woods Conference and how it operationalized and came into being. Second, the formation of the GATT and last, a brief evaluation of Bretton Woods efforts and its relevance in the contemporary era. In the course of this module, we shall touch upon the prevailing political economy of the world during the interwar period and what were the reasons that set into operation the Bretton Woods Conference. We shall analyze the results of this conference and also discuss its relevance in creating an organization for international trade and the efforts that went therein. To begin with, I am tracing the history of the modern day institution of WTO through this pictorial representation. The picture represents that the modern day institution of the World Trade Organization which was born in the era of 1994 owes its existence to a conference that took place in the era of 1944 popularly known as the Bretton Woods Conference. After the Bretton Woods Conference, there was a failed effort on part of the member states to create an international organization for maintaining the world trade order and therefore, the GATT provisionally came into effect and it existed in a provisionally applied form from 1944 till 1994 and thereafter post the Uruguay round of negotiations, the modern day institution of WTO which is a permanent body came into being. A brief history of the Bretton Woods Conference and the political economy of the world prevailing then becomes highly relevant in the issue of understanding how and why GATT has been formed and to what extent the efforts of member countries in combating and regulating world trade in that era succeeded. The political economy of the world during the interwar period presents a very interesting picture. We, th we see through this pictorial representation on this slide that the era of 1870 to 1913 was popularly known as the high noon of capitalism. In this era, the economies of the West also being supported by their colonized countries were the most successful in terms of capital growth and employment and it was uh, the best era where capitalism flourished and which led to frequent and modern trade further leading to global growth. However, the high noon of capitalism was unfortunately broken by the first world war which prevailed from 1914 to 1918 where despite international trade and international commerce happening across the countries, it still could not prevent the bitter rivalry amongst the nations and the political turmoil which led to the violent conflicts and the wars. Therefore, even with an expanded network of global trade and economic growth, countries were still involved in political turmoils which in turn affected international trade and the growth. All of this further culminated into what one of the major threats to world trade that occurred in the era of 1929 was popularly known as the Great Depression. Now, this phase of Great Depression following the phase of a high noon capitalism was characterized by severe fall in output and unemployment which further broke the world trade situation and the relations that were 
prevailing amongst the member states. Having given this brief overview of the political economy during and before the interwar period, we now look into the specific context of the Bretton Woods Conference and how it requires an understanding of the economic situation prevailing in that era. Now, the context immediately preceding Bretton Woods was characterized by severe economic turmoil as the fallen output was by 30 percent and unemployment increased to 24 percent. Apart from the falling economic situation, this era was also characterized by several trade wars and protectionist legislations such as the, mo the most notorious legislation of the US popularly known as the Smoot-Hawley Act. Now, the legislations of this nature were punitive protectionist tools that taxed foreign imports and Smoot-Hawley Act particularly was created from the lobbying group of agricultural lobbying group of those involved in the agricultural segment in the United States as it specifically aimed to protect them from agricultural imports flowing into the US. These protectionist tools and legislations in turn led to retaliatory measures from other trading states, for instance, from the European, European market where countries such as Spain and Italy showed increased protectionism in retaliation to the Smoot-Hawley Act. Therefore, the era of trade wars and protectionist measures were very much in the background of the Bretton Woods Conference. Now, all of this led to the situation which ultimately culminated into the Great Depression. Great Depression of 1929 was characterized by downward spiral in international demand along with the balanced budget policy of the government which could not do much to combat the falling situation. The effects of Great Depression were highly severe as it led to spiral of unpaid debts, it discouraged private funding and further increased the bu budget deficit on part of the government. Along with this economic situation and the prevailing global depression of 1929, one must also note that the policy stance of the governments further worsened the situation. For instance, this was also an era of the prevailing gold standard model. Now, briefly defining what a gold standard model is, pursuant to this model, each national currency is backed by quantity of gold held by country's central bank. Now, due to the gold standard, the central banks despite the economic turmoil could not increase the money supply for a fear that it would compromise the value of their currencies. And this situation further created restricted money supply leading to scarcity of credit and reduction in demand. All of this then led to the era of second world war further char characterized by severe political turmoil and it also affected economy very badly as the per capita income growth fell from 1.31 percent during 1870 to 0 0.88 percent during 1913 to 1950. This was also an era where the high noon of capitalism was followed by severe economic turmoil and therefore the prevailing theory of laissez-faire as advocated by the economist Adam Smith was being doubted. This was also an era which saw the emergence of Keynesian economics as opposed to the prevailing dominant theory of laissez-faire and free market growth economy as promoted by economist Adam Smith. As opposed to markets being free and, oper and operationalizing in a free market situation, Keynesian economy advocated for more state control, which was the need of the hour given the economic and political turmoil. Further on, the capitalist countries were also learning a lesson from a parallel model prevailing in the former Soviet Union, USSR, where the economy was growing 
as strong as the growth rate of up to 5 percent in contrast to the gr global average growth rate of 1 to 2 percent and the political ability to repel Nazi advances into their country. Therefore, on one hand we saw the high noon of capitalism of the western country being followed by severe phase of economic turmoil and the fall of laissez faire theory and on the other hand we saw the emergence of Keynesian economics and the effect and control of market economy such as that of USSR leading to high economic growth. All of this could provide a very good background of understanding the reasons why the Bretton Woods conference took place in 1944. Before moving to the specific details of the Bretton Woods conference, we shall look into specific reasons which triggered the conference in that era. The first reason could be understood by explanation of the concept of beggar thy neighbor. Now, beggar thy neighbor is an international trading policy that utilizes currency devaluation and protective barriers to alleviate a nation's economic difficulties at the expense of other nations. Now, while the policy may help repair an economic hardship in one nation, it will surely harm countries trading partners which will go on to worsen the economic status of world trade as a whole. This era as has been characterized by constant trade wars such as smooth holly act on one hand and act of retaliation from European market was clearly characterized as beggar thy neighbor policy which did not help much in improving the economic situation. Second, this era was also characterized by competitive currency devaluation. Now, the policy of competitive currency devaluation refers to a scenario in which an abrupt national currency devaluation by one nation is matched by a currency devaluation of another, especially if they both have managed exchange rate regimes rather than floating exchange rates regime determined by market forces. Third, this era was also characterized by high tariffs as examples of the prevailing high tariff legislations included the smooth holly Act and other retaliatory tariff measures imposed by the European countries. There was severe discrimination happening in the trading blocks as the prevailing imperial preferences that were involved in tariff, tariff setting and trade such as the policies of Britain in France towards their colonies discriminated against the preferences allotted to non-colonies and this issue is also linked to the banana wars that led to subsequent disputes in against the European community with respect to their imperial preferences being provided to certain colonized countries which did not go well with Latin American countries. However, at that time the era of discriminatory trading blocks was highly detrimental to economic and global world trade which further prompted a conference in the nature of Bretton's Wood. Now, we move on to the discussion pertaining to the Bretton Woods conference and how it operationalized in the first place. I would first highlight upon the August 1941 Atlantic conference which was an economic cooperation effort between the US and Britain. Now, the cooperation efforts began with the strengthening of alliances between the two countries and the vision of economic cooperation was first articulated in the Atlantic Charter that was issued by the US President Roosevelt and British Prime Minister Churchill at the conclusion of August 1941 Atlantic Conference. The focus of this charter was to improve labor standards and lead to economic advancement and social security. Thereafter, February 1942 was characterized by an agreement between the UK and US, specially focusing on lend lease aid, Article 7 of which discussed relevant issues pertaining to production, employment, and exchange or and consumption of goods. All of this finally led 
to certain plans being formulated which are called the predecessors of the Bretton Woods Conference. Now, events that happened in the early 1942 where Dexter and Keynes formulated a plan for the march of global economy prove to be highly relevant for Bretton Woods. By early 1942, US and British officials began preparing certain proposals with the aim of fostering economic stability and prosperity in the post World War order. Harry Dexter, who was the, who was the special assistant to the US Secretary of the Treasury and John Mayard Keynes, who was an advisor to the British Treasury, each drafted two distinct plans. Now, the plans aimed at creating organization that would provide financial assistance to the countries which are experiencing short term balance of payment deficits. The financial assistance would safeguard these countries and thereby prevent them from protectionist or predatory economic policies adopted to improve their balance of payment situation. While both these plans envisaged a world of fixed exchange rate and believed to be more conducive for economic for economics of international trade than the prevailing floating exchange rate, they had different views in this respect. As a result of which, from 1942 until 1944, there were several bilateral and multilateral meetings of allied financial experts that were convened to settle upon a common approach. Finally, an agreement was reached in 1944 in, during the month of July, where United Nations Monetary and Financial Conference took place. Now, this gathering hosted delegates from 44 nations that met in a place called Bretton Woods, which famously came to be known as the Bretton Woods Conference. Now, the results of this conference become relevant for our study. The results for our conference, for the conference were such that it led to the creation of two very vital institutions dealing with economic and economic global order. International Monetary Fund, which popularly is known as IMF, has was made to have three sets of responsibilities, regulatory, financial and consultative. We shall discuss each of these in a bit more detail. The regulatory responsibility of the IMF was to administer rules governing currency values and convertibility and to oversee a system of fixed exchange rates that centered on the US dollar and gold. The financial responsibility of IMF was to supply supplementary liquidity by providing short term financial assistance to the countries experiencing temporary deficits in their balance of payment. The consultative role of IMF was to serve as a forum for consultation and cooperation amongst the governments. The second institution that traced its origin to the Bretton Woods Conference was International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. IBRD, which now is popularly known as the World Bank, was responsible for providing financial assistance for the reconstruction of war ravished nations and the economic development of less developed countries. Therefore, both the institutions, IMF and IBRD, played a very vital role in reconstructing the global trade order and overcoming the financial and economic difficulties that the world was, was undergoing as a result of constant wars and the aftermaths of Great Depression. Now, all of this also becomes relevant to study the background of GATT, which is the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. Now, the reason that Bretton Woods was successful was because it led to the creation of two very vital financial bodies. However, the reasons why Bretton Woods fail and which is very important for trade scholars is because Bretton Woods failed to agree on a common agenda to create a similar institutional body for regulating world trade. 
The reasons why members did not agree to setting up of a similar regulatory body governing world trade was because this era was characterized by several discriminatory tariff regimes that were prevalent. Furthermore, imperial preferences on one hand and punitive legislations such as the Smoot-Hawley Tariffs Act on the other further worsened the situation where politically countries could not arrive at a consensus of agreeing upon a common regulatory framework which could govern these policy preferences and discriminatory tools. Now, the situation culminated into a separate round of negotiations that happened later on, which finally led to the formation of GATT. Therefore, post Bretton Woods, 15 countries re began the talks in December 1945 in order to reduce and bind custom tariff. Now, with the Second World War only recently ended, they wanted to give an early boost to trade liberalization. Thus, they began to correct the legacy of protectionist measures which remained in place from early 1930s. The tariff concessions came into effect by 30th of June 1948 through a protocol named as the Protocol of Provisional Application. This protocol signified the birth of general agreement on tariffs and trade with 23 founding members officially known as the contracting parties to the GATT. Having described the brief background of where GATT holds its origin, we shall now move on to discuss the proposed international trade organization and the role it had to play in the formation of GATT. As we have discussed, less than a month after GATT was signed, the Havana conference began discussing the idea of coming up with international trade organization, a body like the, the IBRD or the IMF for the purposes of world trade. And such talks began in 1947. Now, the context of Havana Charter becomes relevant as it drew a very ambitious draft of encompassing within its purview rules on employment, commodity agreements, restrictive business practices, international investment and services. However, these talks could not further proceed and only four months of the negotiation, the representatives of the 53 countries signed and finished the charter in 1948. After four months of negotiations, the representative countries signed and finished the charter in March 1948. The ITO charter was finally agreed in Havana in March 1948. However, ratification in some national legislations proved impossible. The most serious opposition to the Havana Charter came from the United States Congress, even though the US government had been one of the driving forces behind this charter. An argument of the US was that it was against the new organization to be involved into issues of internal economic regulation. Subsequently, on December 6, 1950, President Truman announced that he would no longer be seeking the support of the Congress for the ITO Charter and therefore, without the support of the US, the ITO could never have come into existence. And this turned as true as Havana Charter after that stalled and could never come into existence. However, the GATT agreement which provisionally was agreed upon in 1948 continued to operate despite the lack of an institutional body like I, the IBRD or the IMF to regulate world trade. The principles under which GATT was operating was mainly non-discrimination and other policies for regulation of international trade and what people thought as a provisional agreement which would ultimately give way to a permanent body in the nature of international trade organization was not successful as ITO never came into being and it was the provisional application by virtue of GATT 1947 
which continued to operate up till the era of 1994, when the birth of World Trade Organization took place. For almost half a century, GATT's basic legal principles remained much as they were in 1948. However, there were additions in the form of a section on development that was added in 1960s and a few plurilateral agreements that were agreed upon by the members in 1970s. Now, CAT's efforts to reduce tariffs further continued and much of this was achieved through a series of multilateral negotiations known as the trade rounds which were held under GATT's regime. Therefore, GATT was provisional with a limited field of action, but its success over 47 years in promoting and securing the liberalization of world trade remains in monumental. The continual reduction in tariff alone helped spur very high rates of world trade growth during the 1950s and 1960s as the, the global growth rate became 8 percent year on an average. Now, the momentum of trade liberalization further helped ensure that trade growth consistently outpaced production growth throughout the GATT era, a measure of countries increasing ability to trade with each other and to reap the benefits of trade. Therefore, the rush of new members during the Uruguay round, which followed the provisional application of GATT, further demonstrated that the multilateral trading system was being recognized as an anchor for development and an instrument of economic and trade reforms. Therefore, the efforts that were put in before the Bretton Woods Conference, which ultimately were aimed at creating the, the International Trade Organization and the charter that was drawn upon, could not succeed in that era. However, with the provisional application of GATT in 1947 and its continued efforts across 50 years of its existence, ensured that when the countries met in 1994, they were ready for a new body to govern and regulate international trade and therefore, the WTO was born with a lot of support from different countries including the developing and the least developed countries of the world. Now, we move on to the last aspect of the presentation and discuss the contemporary relevance of the Bretton Woods Conference. A lot of, a large part of this module has been dealing with the history behind the Bretton Woods Conference and the failure on part of the countries to come up with an international trade organization, whereas similar efforts towards creation of a financial body or a or an economic body in the nature of IBRD was successful. However, we see that the history and politics that went behind the Bretton Woods Conference in that era also holds true in the present era when we compare and contrast the negotiations that are happening at the World Trade Organization today. In the era of Bretton Woods, we have seen extreme inequality that was prevailing amongst the countries and certain preferences such as either protectionist preferences in the form of legislations or policy preferences such as imperial preferences dominated international trade. Even the current era of economic trade and several rounds of negotiations, especially as characterized in the Doha rounds of negotiation, we have seen that certain preferences still continue to hold on part of both the developing and the developed world. And the era is also characterized by extreme inequalities and benefits of trade falling upon some sections of the world, whereas the other sections of the world not being able to benefit from the same growth in global trade. Similarly, in, in and during the era of Bretton Woods Conference, especially in the aftermath of Great Depression, the debate with respect to the Keynesian e economics versus Adam Smith's theory of laissez-faire economy gained much of a discussion. We have seen that in the aftermath of the 2008 depression, similar economic theories have emerged and the debates are still continuing when scholars and economic experts are talking about the, the dominance of one theory and which 
theory and principle is better suited to combat great depression and alike situations. Finally, the utility of Bretton Woods cannot be ignored as Bretton Woods was the conference that led to the formation of both World Bank and the International Monetary Fund and the complexities of modern financial regulation have not lessened in the modern era, but only have increased and therefore, the story behind the formation of these bodies and the economics and the politics which led to certain compromises being made become very relevant when issues of financial regulation are now being invoked by member states. With this, I would end my presentation and provide a brief summary of the various issues that we have touched upon in the course of this module. First, we have analyzed the political economy of the world during the interwar period, having seen the era being characterized by economic turmoil, starting with high noon of capitalism, but leading up till great depression. We have also seen how the prevailing economic and policy instruments of states, such as com competitive devaluation, beggar thy neighbor, policies and discriminatory tariff regimes further culminated into the worsening of economic situations and leading to several forms of trade wars. All of this prompted member nations to meet and hold the Bretton Woods Conference, which proved successful in formulating two vital agencies, the nature of World Bank and IMF. However, a similar effort to formulate an agency to regulate world trade failed as the international trade organization could never come into existence. However, members were able to agree upon the provisional application of a general agreement on tariffs and trade, which would govern certain aspects of regulating international trade. And to everyone's surprise, this provisional agreement continued to operate up till 1994 and with constant trade rounds and additions in the form of various commitments, it provided a very good groundwork for member countries to similarly conclude the formation of the World Trade Organization in 1994. Therefore, even though historical and not factually relevant in the modern context, the story of Bretton Woods and the history and politics behind the formation of GATT and the role of countries in the failure of international trade organization proved to be very relevant in understanding the modern issues that are being dealt with under the WTO's framework. And therefore, the evaluation of Bretton Woods effort surely holds contemporary relevance. Thank you.